There was a lot of change in my life from the time I came as an immigrant um, to Brooklyn, and then six years later, I was a student at Stony Brook um, in an environment very different from New York City, very different from Trinidad, very different from Guyana. So there was a lot of change in my life. But this is a place that's very special to me um, because of the people I encountered and what they did for me and what I was, what I was able to learn and how I came up here. Um, the thing that about Stony Brook um, that was just really, really good for me was it was like a lab, right? I was a student studying English. I minored in journalism. There was not this elaborate journalism school that you guys are experiencing. There was a minor here. But the, the professors I had, they encouraged us to treat the school like its own city, like its own town. And so I had a beat. I covered you know, political happenings on campus. I wrote for Statesman. I was editor-in-chief of a paper called Black World and Alternative as well. I was an RA on campus. And I really just soaked up Eric Stony Brook as a place to learn and grow. Um, and when I left here at 20, um, I went into, I went into an, a training program at the LA Times, a flagship, the flagship at the time for a company called Times Mirror. And then I was really thrown into the hot water because I was covering things like mudslides and skinheads attacking minorities in northern LA County and all kinds of stuff. But all the training that I had here, using this place as a lab, it really did, did prepare me for that. So that's just a little bit about my story. I wanted to, to do three things today um, and really have a conversation with you guys at the end. But number one, I wanted to talk about my story and how um, my journey in communications, where it's gone and where it's led for me. But it's always been journalism as a foundation and communications as a theme throughout all the jobs I've done. And then second, I wanted to talk about how the media landscape has been changing, and it's scary for a lot of people, and it means you know, all kinds of information is com coming at us very, very quickly, and there's a high volume. But I wanted to talk about how you navigate that and what it means for companies um, and how companies are trying to stay relevant and how consumers are digesting it all. And then third, I wanted to talk about what it means for you as students who are going to enter a career um, and hopefully your career is going to be a diverse career that's going to take all kinds of twists and turns. But I wanted to talk about how best do you prepare yourself for an environment that's always changing. And the one rule about life, about industry, is that it's always going to change. But you're going to be the constant in that. And how you adapt to that environment is the most critical thing. So let, let's, let's talk about my, my story <laughs> a little bit. Um, so, you know, when I was sitting in journalism classes it, at Stony Brook, you know, 20 plus years ago, I never thought I'd be in certain situations that I was in later. Those situations included, um, most recently at MSNBC, the president attacked a, a couple of our anchors. Has anyone seen a show called Morning Joe at MSNBC? <laughs> um, our anchors... Um, were in a, uh, a fight with the president um, around some of, some of their analysis on air. And the president, who has said he doesn't really watch the show, um, but apparently he seems like he does watch the show quite, 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 quite often, um, sent a, a tweet that was disparaging about an anchor, Mika Brzezinski. And that led then to our organization having to decide were we going to put out a response to the president. And I was involved in, in shaping our response to the president. But when I was sitting in journalism class in 1993, 1994, I didn't think that my road in journalism as an English major, as an English minor, would, would wind its way to me being in the position of, OK, having to work on content that would involve the president of the United States. But my, but my journey has been quite interesting, and it's been really three or four chapters. One, I worked as a newspaper reporter. I worked for the LA Times, the Hartford Current, and for Newsday. Um, and I really consider myself, even today, a journalist by training and someone whose critical thinking 
is really grounded in the kind of research that journalists do, which is you never assume anything. You dig, dig, dig until you know the answers. You don't take anything at face value, and you're always curious and inquisitive. I see part of the Far, far Beyond campaign says the first thing I think it says, we are curious, right? <coughs> and it's curiosity that drives journalism and, and truth-telling more than anything else. Then after, after I was a newspaper reporter, I moved into government PR. Um, so I was Elliot Spitzer's press secretary. Anyone knows who Elliot Spitzer is? Yeah. Ooh, the former governor. Former governor. Um, um, very, very smart and capable guy, but also very flawed individual. Um, and was uh, felled, resigned after it came to light um, that he was cavorting with prostitutes. So I was his press secretary when that all happened. Um, and I had to manage the transition from Elliot Spitzer as governor into David Patterson as governor, and he was the first African-American governor. He was also the first uh, blind governor in New York, New York history, but also the second uh, blind governor, I think, in, in, in US history. So that transition was, was pretty amazing, even though I didn't go into that role expecting I went into it expecting, I'd work in government for a while for Governor Elliot Spitzer. I did not think he would be felled very, very quickly. But I learned a lot of lessons, and I tried to keep my head on straight through all of that. And those lessons have actually helped me in many, many different jobs, including the job I'm in now. Because one thing I've learned is, and you learn this as a journalist too, is like you never know what's around the corner. You never know what's, that there's, there's a facade and then there's the reality often. And, I, and I've just learned to never be surprised by where, where, where stories will go. And I think when, when you talk about curiosity, curiosity teaches you that there always could be something else there that you just don't know. Um, and then after working um, in government, I, I, I did consulting work. Um, do, do folks know about PR companies and consulting and working client client related work? Is that something you guys are familiar with? Mm -hmm. So there are there are consultancies that do all kinds of work, everything from accounting to to um, health related consulting. But there's also a group of companies that do public relations consulting, and I work for a company called Edelman, which is a large global company that does, among other things, crisis management which is sort of like, I think, it's been, at least in, in, in popular culture, been dealt with in shows like Scandal, <coughs> where you know, you've got Olivia Pope. Some of my friends have called me Oliver Pope <laughs> <laughs> because, because some of the issues that, I, that I've dealt with. I remember in working for Edelman, there was one weekend where I was working for, on issues, there were three New York Times stories in one weekend that all involved my clients. I had, in my time, there any, anywhere from 10 to 15 clients at once. Um, and they included clients like AOL, clients like <coughs> Axe Body Spray, which has like all kinds of edgy commercials where people react to those commercials. Um, clients like General Electric. Um, clients like the folks who are redeveloping LaGuardia Airport. That was one of my last clients. So a diverse array of clients. One of my clients included um, it, it, um, included the father of the Newtown shooter. Um, I, I provided counsel. If you do a Google search on Errol Cockfield, you will see that I provided counsel to the father of the Newtown the Newtown shooter because there are people who are in lots of situations that they don't expect in life and they need counsel. Um, so I did that work, and then um, last year NBC called me and recruited me to be the head of PR for MSNBC, uh, which is a really interesting job because it's a marriage of so many of my former lives, because it's got, we do politics, and I've worked in the political world. It's a media company, and I've worked in journalism. And also at times, you know, we do work that's defensive work, like the case where the president attacked, attacked a couple of our anchors. And I've done defensive work at Edelman. So it's a, it's a cool job because it brings all of these skills that I've learned over the years under, under one house. 
So that's, that's my journey. But the thing about that journey that knits it all together is communications. So I'm training as a journalist, but all of these jobs have had as a central theme the written word, the spoken word. And the one thing I'll, I always say to students when I talk is literacy, I see literacy in the biggest sense. I know you, you guys focus a lot on news literacy here, and I'll talk a little bit about that soon. But I believe that in order to succeed, no matter what industry you're in, if you're a scientist, you're a school teacher, you're a journalist, you have to be immersed in literacy in the fullest sense. That's verbal, that's written, that's charm offensive, that's walking into a room and being able to get people to talk to you about something that they wouldn't readily talk to you about. Or, or writing an email and crafting it in such a way that someone reads that email and they go, oh, I really want to really call, her, call her and talk to her. Because the way she framed that email touched me, was empathetic, it drew me out, right? Um, so literacy, I think people often think of literacy as the ability to read and write. I see literacy as the ability to use words um, to navigate, to attract, to push back, you know, as, 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 you know, weaponry, but also in a seductive way. They're tools, right? And that, that's how I see literacy. Now, I want to I wanna spend a little time talking about what's going on in the media landscape right now and how companies are trying to adapt to the media landscape. And it's been really fascinating for me to see how it's changed because when I, when I was learning to be a journalist, everything was print TV, right? The internet was this... Um, it was a place where a few professors were hanging out sharing ideas about research, right? It had existed, but it, but it was really only an academic tool. So we're going back to the, to the early, mid-90s. And then I heard buddies of mine who were actually STEM students. This is a, the first time I heard the term email was 1993. A couple of my engineering friends here at Stony Brook were saying to each other, oh, I'll send you an email. I didn't, what, what, what is that? Actually, at the time, I didn't even ask what that was because it was just gobbledygook to me. <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have the guts to ask, what is an email and how do you use it to communicate with each other? But by the late 90s, the internet, websites, they had all proliferated. And now they pretty much drive our lives. And industry is trying to contend, especially the media industry, is contending with how do we get your attention, eyeballs, right? Because eyeballs mean dollars. Eyeballs mean survival. How do we get your attention in such a way that we sustain it? And that's everything from the New York Times to MSNBC to CNN to BuzzFeed. It's all about, okay, you're gonna go to a device, whether that device is your phone, the television, you know, a, a laptop. How do, how do we get you to stay there? Because why is it important for us to get you to stay there? Anyone? Because we're the product. Uh, You're not the product. Well, we, we, we create the content that is the product that right. you... Right. That, but you're onto something right there. Yeah. The ads. Ads. We give you product and content, but we, we sell space to advertisers who also want to get your attention while you're getting that content and that product. And the thing that's driving the tension in media right now is how do we sustain your attention in such a way that you look at those ads? Because before the internet, it was very clear. You subscribe to a newspaper or a magazine and you flip through it and you came to a full page ad for some sneakers or a new TV or whatever it was. Now, when you go to your phone and you're, you're on your favorite websites or whatever it is, or you're on Instagram, on Facebook, and you see sponsored content, what, what's happening there is we're trying to interrupt your attention to have, you, to have you pay attention, right? Before, that was much easier with print. It was much easier, and it's much easier with traditional TV, which, which many of you still consume, but some of you are cord cutting and, 
and, and, do, and doing other things. But the reality is you're still getting video. It's just a matter of what the platform is. So the question is, how do we get the advertising to you in such a way that advertisers still keep paying us the money that drives our business? And what I see happening is there is so much competition around that. We're, we're in a period where there's this pitch battle going on, right? Because it used to be, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, you had ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS on TV. <laughs> now you've got so many platforms, at least visually, trying to get your attention. So the question is, how, do you, how, does, a, how does a media company even survive in an environment like that, right? How do you generate dollars in an environment like that? So, so that's got people nervous, right? And it's got... I think even in the dynamic of, of professors talking to you guys or early career people talking to you guys, are there conversations that you guys hear about, is, is uh, print still going to be around? Anybody here? Yeah. I'd love to hear some thoughts about that. You said yeah. What do you hear? Well, just how like print's dead, why are you even bothering to be a journalism major? There's no point. Is print dead though? <laughs> I think about it a lot. Is print dead? No. It's not dead. It's just in a different place. Is TV dead? No. Oh, well, TV arguably is changing, but is video dead? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's just in a different place, right? So what's happening with, with smart media companies is they're adapting. They're creating video, but they're just putting it in different places. In the case of MSNBC, we have our video. You can watch Rachel Maddow at 9 o'clock at night, but if you miss Rachel Maddow, you can watch it at 10 on, on the streaming app, or you can watch it the morning after, right? And there's advertising around that as well. The advertising dollars on the streaming is not as strong as it is for the traditional. It hasn't tipped yet, but it's getting pretty close where it may tip soon. But that brings me, because I want to I take some questions and, and have, a, and have a, a, a wider conversation with all of you, but it brings me to the third part of what I want to talk about, which is where do you fit in all of that? So there's a lot of gloom and doom about change, but I actually think change is tremendous opportunity, right? One of the things that I've been very gratified by in my career is that I've been able to change and adapt you know, some of it by my own doing but, doing, but some of it through circumstances forced me to change, like Elliot Spitzer resigning. <laughs> but it's made me think about where can I use communications, in what platforms, in what houses, where can I work, where, where, how do I need to change as a professional, right? So the question for you guys, to me, isn't so much, is this thing going to die or is this thing going to live? But it's how are you going to grow to adapt, to be ready for the environment that you're stepping into, which may be very different in five years, very different in 10 years, very different in 25 years. But there are some truths about the environment, regardless of how the environment is. One thing that's a real truth that is awareness, right? Um, I'm big on awareness because awareness is like driving a car. It's like you got to see what's happening in front of you. you got to see what's happening behind you. Awareness tells you where the industry is going. Is that important? It's pretty important, right? Because you'll know if, you don't, if you're not aware, you don't know how you need to change. So that means you need to read, consume information about the industry you're interested in. How is it changing? Or even sister industries or brother industries, how are they changing? Because if you... Walk, if you try to apply for things and you're not building the profile you need for those jobs, you'll never get hired. You'll never, you'll never get to the next job and the next job, right? So awareness is, is important. And then, so there's the radar around awareness, but then there's the skills. And I always come back to skills. Skills are curiosity. Strong writing skills, strong verbal skills. Can you, I, cha I challenge people I know, can you stand up in front of a room and talk for five minutes, much, much less 50 minutes? 
Can you talk to a room for five minutes and organize your thoughts? I think that's really important. Whether you're going to be in journalism, media, communications, or you're going to be a farmer, a teacher, whatever it is. So, you know, we have two kids in my house. My thing with them is you've got to be good communicators no matter what. Um, and I think that's really, really important because you never know when you're going to be in a situation where you're chatting with someone and it leads to you potentially getting a job offer or it's three, four degrees of separation. Um, my last job, I believe I got, they still don't, won't tell me, but I believe I got because someone gave them a tip about me. It was one of these things where they like called a bunch of people and someone said, call this guy. And, and, I, and I still keep asking the recruiter, how do you find me? And he says, we have our ways. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really important to use communications as a, as a device, right? So, so, it, so skills, right? Going back to skills. Another skill that I think is really important is networking, especially when you're in college and coming out of college and building a kind of DNA around networking, right? So whenever you walk into a room, it's a conference, a meeting of like-minded people, <coughs> what should you do? Start conversations. Correct. And sometimes it's really, really hard, I think, because people who are in communications, actually many of them are quite shy because writing is actually a very introspective process. But in the environment we're in, that's so competitive with so much coming at us, you really need to try your best to be an extrovert to the degree you can. Meet people, take their information, business cards, following up with email, following up with calls. How did you connect? What struck you about someone? Putting that all down and, and, and following up and building relationships um, over the long term. Um, you know, the, the other thing on this is, and I lost my train of thought, but on, on networking, I see networking as actually a kind of art form. And it's not just the conference. It's, there are opportunities for you to work on networking in instances you would never think. I actually think of the Thanksgiving table when like 10, 10 extended family members come over as like a way to practice communication and networking, right? So people often ask me, this, sounds, this might sound silly and ridiculous, but one of the things I often get a question about is, what do you do? What do you do for a living? Why is it important? Why is it compelling, right? You need to have an elevator pitch around what it is you do, even as a student or an early career person, because it needs to be compelling for someone to keep talking to you and to be interested in potentially hiring you. And I consider Thanksgiving table or hanging out with friends or a barbecue, those are safe spaces to actually practice these things. It's a safe space to try to be the extrovert without room for error. So if you go hang out with some friends and someone asks you, what are you studying? And you just say, well, I'm in the journalism school. That's a pretty flat answer. But you might use the barbecue as an opportunity to build out a two minute pitch about what it is you do, why you're at the journalism school, what's driving you, why are you passionate about it, right? What's going on in the world around you? What's going on with news literacy and the fact that, that you know, Russians are potentially using Facebook to manipulate our elections? Maybe you're passionate about it because of that. But, but you have the option to give the flat answer or to give the dynamic answer. And the more you practice it in safe spaces and get good at it, the more you're going to be willing to try it in the, in the space where there's less room for effort. That's when you're being interviewed for a job, or you're being interviewed for the amazing graduate program you want to get into, right? So skills building, really, really important, because no matter how much the media environment is going to change, these are constant that you can bring to any environment. Because whether BuzzFeed exists today, or CNN goes broke, 
there's going to be someone that's going to take the place of that media company to find the eyeballs and the attention. And they're going to need curious people. They're going to need people who are verbally literate and orally literate to do all the things that they need to do. So in my case, I thought, you know, hey, maybe it'd be cool one day to work at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. I didn't end up at those places, but I've ended up at some pretty cool places. And I'm 44, and I don't know where else this journey is going to lead, right? So with that, I'll take some of your questions. I know I've been talking for a while. Go ahead. Um, working at in SBC as their <coughs> communications and media strategist, okay? mm -hmm. yeah. Are you guys like looking into main sources of revenue that aren't advertising? Um, so, so that's a very good question. So, the way that um, cable companies, let's talk about cable companies for, for a minute. Um, cable companies, um, you guys, you guys are students. You probably have TV. Do you have do folks have TVs in their dorm rooms? We have cable access. You have cable access. So you probably have a cable. Uh, yeah, you probably have a curated number of channels that you have that the university provides to you that's part of what you pay for for your housing, right? Mm -hmm. In order for you to get certain channels um, through cable, you have to pay a monthly fee. That's a subscription fee. Within that subscription fee, different channels get fees to them, right? So MSNBC through its relationship with cable providers, get subscription fees automatically from anyone who subscribes to a package of channels. Um, same thing for HBO, same thing for CNN, right? These are deals that are made. That is not advertising. That is a straight subscription fee. The advertising that we get is a top that, right? Where Mercedes-Benz says, we want to sell cars, and Rachel Maddow's show is a really, really hot show, so we want to do an ad uh, during, during that show. You know, it's like when, when anchors say, okay, time to pay the bills, and we'll be back. Right? So, so in the case of cable news, that's one example. I'm trying to think of other examples where folks, other than advertising, there are some, but they're just, they're just not at the top of my mind right now, but the subscriber fees are an example. Um, with majoring in English, like, did you always intend to go into communication journalism, or did you have like a different idea in mind with that major? When when I came here, it's like you know my journey is interesting because when I came here, I actually came here as a STEM student. I wanted to I, in high school, I went to Brooklyn Tech, and I majored in biomedical engineering. At as a the school I went to was um, a specialized high school with a very tailored curriculum. So I was dissecting pigs, doing like <laughs> learning anatomy, all of this stuff, taking AP chemistry. And then when I came to Stony Brook, I started doing a lot more writing, which is my passion. I write poetry, I do a lot of creative writing and performance. And my whole, my interest just started to shift away from the sciences. So I told my parents I was going to be an English major, I was going to be a writer, and they said, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, I met some people affiliated with the newspapers on campus and started writing for newspapers, and that got me interested in journalism, so then I tacked on the journalism minor. But it was actually my activities kind of drove uh, my academic interests. So that's how, that's how I switched. Um, but no, com coming in here, I did not, I didn't know what kind of writer I wanted to be. I didn't know where I wanted the words to go, but by the time I'd left here, it was pretty much a journalism focus. Let's go here and then you, yeah. You've covered a wide variety of issues in your journalism career. This is a bit of a professional question. How, in a, you know, an honest to God, people are getting paid newsroom, do you establish yourself as someone who can cover, you know, both hip hop artists and <coughs> mudslides? And, and <laughs> like a what? And the West Side Stadium. And the West Side Stadium, yeah. Yeah, you sound like you did some research there. <laughs> um, how do you, I think your question is, how do you, does, does diversity work or does specialization work? Is yes. that how you get what you're getting at? I'm, I'm of, um, I think that early career people should be as diverse as possible. Like you should be willing to raise your hand 
to cover anything, your editors, whatever the decision makers want you to go out there and, and cover, be willing to go, right? Um, and there are a lot of uh, early career folks that have problems around this. They have an idea, they, they only want to cover this, they only want to cover that, and the people who run these places, they're just trying to get the job done. They're trying to put the product out and they want partners in putting the product out, right? And if you seem like a crybaby, they don't want to work with you. They want people that are going to work till midnight. They want people who are going to work weekends, who are going to do whatever it takes. I had a, I had a situation with, with an employee where it was a big night and everyone was dug in. I mean, people were willing to sleep on cots if they needed to. And this employee, at a certain point in the night, said to me, I'm really tired, can I go home? And everyone else was dug in, willing to do an all-nighter if they need to, willing to leave at four and come back at six if they needed to, right? And that's the kind of, especially in media and communications, unlike many other fields, I think, I think medicine is, a, is, is like one of those fields where you know, you can be working 30 hours straight, you know. But there, there are fields like maybe accounting where it's like 9 to 5, banking, you know. But if you want to be in media, communications, the written word, and if you want to hold to a 9 to 5 schedule, it's probably not the business for you. Because you might find yourself coming into the office at 5 o'clock in the morning to finish editing a tape or to finish writing a story because you need someone to read it at 9 o'clock in the morning and you need it to be perfect. I had many days when I was a reporter where I was wrestling with a story. I just couldn't sleep, right? So I got up early and I got into the office super, super early so I could like fine tune every single line so that I presented my best product. Um, are you more interested at this point in uh, the PR side of of journalism when it comes to like NBC, or do you um, miss the aspects of being a um, reporter? Good question. Um, and just to finish on that last point, I do think it's important to specialize as you become later career, to have things that you're really, really good at. But early on, I think it's a willingness to cover everything, but to specialize. Like when when I left journalism, I had a range of, of special beats I had covered, politics, real estate, and economic development. Um, and that, that allowed me to do better journalism, but it also made me attractive to other organizations. So do try to specialize, but be, but be willing to raise your hand to do different things. Uh, on the question of do I miss it, um, I, I do miss it, some, I do miss big stories sometimes, you know? But I feel like each of my career steps has had its place uh, to bring me to where I am. Um, what's really cool about my job now is that I'm doing PR for a media company, but we're also covering the big stories. So uh, I'm in the midst of I'm in the midst of it. I'm not doing the news gathering, but I'm very much in touch with all that's happening, and I'm promoting the brand. So it's like a it's a good marriage of those, of those two worlds. Okay. Just wondering, uh, how's the work culture at MSNBC? Is it as partisan as you know some people who watch the the news seem to think it is? No, it is not a partisan work culture. <laughs> you know, um, so it's uh, we are an open house. You know, we we accept people of all you know political folds. You know, so it's you know it's funny. People are about the work. It's not like we come in and and. And, and, and work and take the temperature of where people are politically. We're trying to cover the news every day, right? So, <clears throat> sorry, so um, you bounced around a lot in different positions, right? Yeah, um, I definitely bounced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which one would you say that you know, starting to work helped you, you know, sort of get to the most? Like, which one did it mean? Uh, was more the most relatable. You which mean? one did it prepare you for the most? Like, which one of the most? I think I think I think um, the way yeah, I had some really good professors here. Two that come to mind: um, I had a professor named Paul Schreiber. Um, he just retired. Um, actually, Paul Schreiber is probably the single most impactful person in my career. Period. Um, and when I. Uh, the way he would do his classes was you would um, you would have a beat. 
So you would behave like a reporter. So at the beginning of the semester, he'd say, your beat is going to be this, and you have to cover stories. So I would go out and cover stories out of my beat, and then I'd have to talk to sources and make it clear to people that I was talking to them for a class assignment. But that preparation allowed me, when I did my first internship, um, which was with Newsday, actually, I, I understood the process of how you go about writing a story. How do you get both sides? How do you research information? Because Paul Schreiber had made his class like a lab for, the, for getting journalism done. And I had um, another professor named Bob Green, who's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, he actually started the journalism school at Hofstra, even though he wanted to start one here before how he started this one here. Um, but they were both both great in terms of the technicality of journalism, how do you have the getting it done. And so when I did my first my first journalism jobs, all that training was almost like second nature to me. How you how you went about writing a lead. Um, what was a nut graph? I don't know if you guys know what a nut graph is. I don't know if these terms cha are changing, you know. Um, a nut graph, right? Good. That's good. That's hard. <laughs> Um, Still right with an app, though. Yeah, a, yep. kick, a kicker. What do you use for, you know, what, what information do you say for a kicker? Um, oh, like yeah. You know, so, so, all, so all, all of those things, you know, I did not have as much apprehension when I was doing the, those first jobs. Because some people, you know, I, I sometimes talk to students who are studying journalism, and I ask them, where, where, are, your, where are your writing samples? And they don't have any writing samples. And I say, if you don't have writing samples, whether you're trying to go into video, something visual, or something written, writing is the source of all of it. If you're doing video, you got to write scripts. you got to have questions to interview subjects. So you can't have this partition in your mind that I don't like words, but I'm still going to do journalism because I'm doing the visual stuff, so I'll walk around with the camera. or. If you can't frame it all together, you know, just scrap it and try something else. I don't know how much time we have, but you know, I have the afternoon, so yeah, I'm yeah. Happy. <laughs> we can keep it going in the back. Uh, was there ever a time where you think that you really should have gotten fired, and could you learn from it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's probably a few times I think I should have gotten fired, or 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 there should have been consequences for things that I that I did. Um, one time, um, one time, I mean, I got lucky because there was just a loss of interest, but one time in my, my uh, Newsday internship, I got lost. I mean, we're talking, we're talking 1992, and there's no GPS, there's no, there's just maps, and it's like, go here. And I drove to the location, and I couldn't find it for the life of me. I just couldn't find it. And I got into the location after everything had ended. And then, and then I came back to the newsroom just freaked out, scared out of my mind. But what happened was the changes in, in just the demand for stories that day, something else took over. And my little story that I went to cover, nobody cared about it. <laughs> so, so, um, but I also think like when you're doing an internship, people give you more more room for error. But that was one of the you know the scariest days for me because I was like, oh my god, you know. Nowadays, you just put in an address and you get there. Um, yeah, but and, and then there are some other times when I was working in politics. I won't get into detail, but um, I was working in real rough and tumble politics in in some instances and. Uh, it gets like really dirty in politics. I mean, it, on a on a on a scale that I couldn't imagine. We're talking, we're talking um, reputation destruction. I'm talking, a guy walks into my office and says, "I want that guy taken down," or "I want this entire thing shredded," and it's my job, along with a group of other people, to do some stuff. This is this is a. Uh, it's, it's using the media to get what you need done. I, don't, I won't elaborate. But, but in those instances, it's very, very high stakes. And it's like some of the stuff that you see on TV, I've actually experienced it in real life. 
<laughs> it's not fiction. I've, I've been asked to do things where in cases I have to be like, I am not doing that. Where it was, you know, using something someone has done to bring attention to this person in a certain light. And I, and I had to do work like that. While reporting, have you ever been, I guess, maybe like targeted for something that you've done? Like maybe say you wrote something about a politician and they didn't like it, so they like yeah, that was every day, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's been so many. I mean, in in my time reporting, there are so many calls from people who didn't like what I wrote, or like include like readers and also people on either side of an issue, right? Um, that, that's, that comes with the territory. Um, in fact, I think you're not, if you're not, if you're not doing a good job, then you're not touching people, you're not making people feel. I've always seen writing as a provocation in my mind. Um, it's either a good provocation or a bad provocation or somewhere in between. But if you're not provoking a response, then what are you doing it for, right? Even when I write a text message, something as simple as a text message, you know, I think of it as a provocation. Like, I don't want to just relay. I, I want to actually get response. To what extent do you take their, uh, their concerns like, into account? Oh, yeah, very much. Uh, so, so one of the things, if, if you guys ever become beat reporters, um, there's really, you really have to take what, what the... It's like an ecosystem, right? And you have to, if you write something one day and you think you really did, you should have had more of one side or the other, there are gonna be dozens of other stories that you have to do and you might have to spend more time with the folks who feel like they didn't you know, get enough or they got short thrift in a story, whatever it is. So, so there's often time um, for that push-pull uh, to, to deal with that. So, but you have to have an open mind. There are often reporters who are fairly stubborn about what they've written and it being right, but uh, when I did it, I always had more of an open mind about, okay, maybe I could have had an extra quote from someone or, or added some more information on this issue, and I would try to, in subsequent stories, um, deal with that if I felt it was a fair criticism. What did you have to do to get your internship at Newsday? Um, Look, I've been very lucky, um, I'll say. Uh, my, my, Stony Brook, my, my Newsday internship application was handed to me by Paul Schreifer. Um, because, I, you know, I was lucky that he handed it to me, but I think I also did work that got him to say, okay, I'm going to hand this application to, to Errol Cockfield. Um, I, I, I've been aggressive about getting certain things in my life, but I've also been fortunate that people have reacted to me in a certain way where they've, they've helped me out or built a partnership with me. Um, and I have never, I tell people this, I have never formally, like I never um, applied for a job in the traditional sense. Every job that I've had came because like in the case of that internship, Paul Schreiber gave me the application, right? Um, or in the case of MSNBC, NBC called. In the case of Edelman, Edelman called, right? So, and, and this is why I talk about networking at the, in the middle of, 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 what, of my remarks. In the case of Edelman, as an example, I, a former <coughs> boss of mine at another job had a dinner party. And I went to the dinner party because I, I keep in touch with this former boss. And at that dinner party, there was an Edelman person there. And the Edelman person was one of two people who said to Edelman, you should bring this guy in for a conversation. Around the same time that I went to that dinner, I went to, there was a politician I used to cover. And I've, I've become friendly with this politician. I've just kept in touch with him. He's no longer a politician. He's a lawyer. And he invited me to his house, um, the weekend house, just to hang out. I went to the weekend house, and I met a guy from Edelman. Well, I met his wife first. And his wife said, you know, my husband would be interested to meet you. And then he came the next day, and he worked at Edelman. So within the same period, the house rental and the dinner party 
these two Edelman people suggested me to, to Edelman to hire. The moral of that story is, how did I get to the house rental? <laughs> Network. I kept in touch with the guy who I covered. How did I get to the dinner party of the former boss? Correct. Correct. So, Edelman, I did not go to Edelman's website and say, what jobs is Edelman? I've never done that. And I mean, and I feel that I'm very lucky that I've, I've never gone on monster.com and scanned. I've never done any of that, right? One job has pretty much led to an, when I went to work for Elliot Spitzer, Elliot's people called me and said, we want you to work in the administration, right? Um, Howie Schneider, who's the dean of the school, he appointed me as the Albany bureau chief for Newsday when I covered politics, right? So I, I didn't go to Howie and say, I really want to be Albany bureau chief. Um, Howie said, we think you ought to be Albany bureau chief. And I said, wow, it's cold in Albany. <laughs> and, and so I had to really think about, do I really want to move my life to Albany? Um, at the time, I was like a single guy doing pretty well. And I was like, I don't know if there's any ladies up there. Like, you know, like how I like it. It's cold. I don't know what the ladies is like up there. Um, but I know there's opportunity. <laughs> so I decided to go. Right. Um, I'm from Albany, okay. so I want to argue that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but straight up, though, I went, and there was some ladies up there. <laughs> Good. I was good at all. Yeah, Still own property. That's quote. That's quote. I'm using that quote. <laughs> uh, where, you got a question? Any more questions? Yeah. Did you ever like regret the way that you may have portrayed someone? In yes. Well, one one of the things that to the questions of like, did I ever think I, I should? Did I do something that I thought I should be fired for? Yes. Did I, um, did I ever write stories I wasn't entirely proud of? Yes. I mean, the reality, you should try to avoid these things, but the, the reality of career and life is that you're gonna, do, you're gonna try to do your best, hopefully, but sometimes you fall short, but you get up and you keep going. It sounds cliche, but you can really learn from these hard lessons, right? I had, I had some hard lessons mid-career, right? You know, there were times at Newsday I was not happy. I was not happy about my beat. I wasn't happy about my editors. I remember my, my, first, my first week at Newsday, I said to the, the editor in charge, the new cub reporter, I'm told I'm gonna cover a town in uh, Suffolk County called Smithtown. Anybody know Smithtown? Yeah. Right? You know, I'm gonna cover Pat Vecchio, who's, who just got ousted. This is crazy, but he was like one of the first guys I covered. So I say to the editor, um, you know, okay, let's talk about Smithtown and how should I cover it and how has it traditionally been covered? And I've read the stories going back 10 years about Smithtown. So I say to the guy, what do you think? And he says to me, just go out there and see what you see. That was it. He never said, we've covered too much of this, too much of that, too little of this. I think we ought to dig into this guy, that guy. And, and I thought, that's nuts. He said, just go out there and see what you see. Now, but the thing was, journalism, and I think one of the things that's still true about journalism, it's, it's very much, and this is true of film and just content making, it's still very much like an apprenticeship kind of thing where you learn at the foot of the master, and he'll say, um, I won't talk to you for five days, but on the sixth day, I shall teach you how to stroke the brush in this direction. <laughs> That's what it's still like, which is crazy. I think when you, look at, when you look at certain companies, like truly corporate America, when you look at training, um, they've come a lot farther than media companies. Media companies are still very much trial and error companies. And as you think about going into media, whichever form of media you may go into, you have to know that that can be what you're walking into. You may walk into uh, an environment where, where people are nice and they train you and they pick you up, and, but you could go into an environment where they put you at a desk and they just say, figure it out, right? And, and you have to know how do you build Back to the networking point, how do you find your Paul Shrivers, <laughs> right? So, and that means going out and doing what? Networking. Right. <laughs> and, and trying it first where? 
Uh, safe spaces. Safe spaces. Barbecue Thanksgiving, it's all safe spaces. So, like, I annoy my wife because when we go out among friends, I'm always, it's not, it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm not pitching, right? I'm, it's not like it's all a game, but it's training. I consider it training. So, if someone's asking me about work, who I've recently met, I use it as a way to fine tune how I talk about work. Because they've asked me, right? So I might as well, right? Um, so when someone asks you about your circumstance, have something to say. Think about what it is you're doing and what it means to you. If it's flat, if it, then maybe it's not for you because the passion isn't coming through, right? You might need to find something else that connects you to, to passion, and people can pick that up. Because when someone has passion, they want to talk to that person again about what it is they do, because passion is contagious, right? Two quick questions. One, um, what did Governor... There's no such thing as two quick questions, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> what did Governor Patterson think of the SNL sketches? Uh, at first, they were hilarious, but eventually, not so hilarious. <laughs> All right, and uh, economically, how, at what point in your career as a journalist did you get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm middle class. <laughs> well, I think the government defines that, not me. But um, <laughs> I'm big on benchmarks. And, um, you know, so I might have an idea of what I consider middle class to be for me, but the government has another idea about that. That's, I say that because it's important for you as a, someone who's being trained as a journalist to understand that. Um, this is a bit of a sidebar, but one of the things that really frustrates me in conversation is when people say things about what they feel about things. All right, so do you feel that someone is wealthy? Do you feel someone is middle class? Do you feel someone is poor? So I have friends who say things like, I'm poor. But if you make $150,000 a year, you're not poor. <laughs> okay, so, don't, no, so, so, so the way we talk to each other can connote certain things about feelings, but they don't necessarily, that's not what the government defines as poor. I'm not saying we have to be that precise, but sometimes we do, right? Because you sound ridiculous when you're actually middle class or upper middle class and you say to someone else, I'm so poor. Sounds kind of ridiculous, right? right? So I always remind people that things like median income and <laughs> what middle class is, right? But to your question, um, I think your larger question is around, okay, when you pick a career, what, are, what do you consider comfortable for that career, right? And you have to make a personal decision about that, right? So when I was a journalist, through various beats and moving around, I had gotten to a point where I was firmly middle class, or what might even be defined as upper middle class, when I left journalism, right? Um, but one of the real struggles I had thinking about being a family person down the road was, okay, what, what can I build around this career, right? And I think one of the challenges for journalists now more than ever because there's so much competition is that in order to be what I would say upper middle class or upper, upper class, you have to cobble many things together. Right? You might cover a beat, but write a book. Uh, you might, so, you know, um, or, you know, work two jobs, you know, um, be a professor and a journalist, you know, things like that. Um, it depends on the market you're in. New York is a really tough market, but there are other markets that aren't as tough, you know, so it, 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 all, it all depends, but you've got you've to gotta decide that for, you, for yourself. How were you able to become uh, president of the NABJ? Um, that, well, I've always, um, one of the reasons why I'm here is because, you know, giving back has always been part of my core um, because of people like Paul um, Triber, uh, because, you know, there were people who took great interest in me when I was coming up. Uh, one story, another, another Newsday person, Barbara, you know Caddy Gray, right? You know Caddy Gray? Yeah, Caddy Gray is a Newsday writer. And um, when I interviewed um, 
<laughs> after Paul Schreiber gave me the uh, application and, and I went to Newsday to interview, um, I met this woman from Arkansas named Caddy Gray, who's this just, she's just deliciously gregarious woman, <laughs> just oozing with personality, right? And so I get there and Paul Schreiber had told Caddy Gray, there's going to be this guy here interviewing, kind of shepherd him around. Right? So I get there, and Caddy Gray, who's African American, takes me around. She takes me to each interview. Um, by the end of the day, um, I, they told me I had the internship. But Caddy was just so sweet to me. She had never met me until that day. But she literally took me around to each person and said, There's this guy from Stony Brook. He's a young guy. He's bright. And Paul told me about him. And, you know, so each, each step along the way, she said something nice as I sat for, for each interview. But then what really brought it home for me was at the end of the night. Now, Caddy Gray lived in Brooklyn at the time. She drove me from Stony Brook's headquarters in Melville <coughs> to Stony Brook, to my dorm room. She drove east <laughs> an hour. From, from Melville, or 45 minutes, and then drove fr from Stony Brook to Brooklyn. And I, this, just, this just blew my mind. I was like, this woman took me around all day, and Brooklyn is really far from campus. <laughs> <laughs> right, right? You know, so, so, That's and I was like, I was like, why, it made me think, why did she do this, you know? Uh, there's giving, but then there's like giving, right? <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, I'm like 18, you know. So I'm thinking, so I meet, I meet Caddy Gray, but then when I started to, eventually I got a job at Newsday, and Caddy was involved with the, the black journalist group. And so she started to ask me to do things, like volunteer here and there. And because of her involvement, I was just like, and all that she had done for me, I was like, I got to give back. So I started mentoring students. I did a, um, a high school journalism workshop. I ran a couple of summers every Saturday, 9 to 5. We uh, worked with high schoolers. Is that first day? Hmm? That first first day? day? Yeah, I'm going to shake your hand. You don't know first day. Yeah, what? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the newspaper, the newspaper uh, we put together is called First Take. And uh, we also would do a broadcast with the students. So that was like my first volunteer thing that I did with the New York Association of Black Journalists, which led to me becoming the vice president, which led to me becoming the president of the chapter, which led to me becoming a national board member of the National Association of Black Journalists. Right? Really, when you trace it all back, <laughs> it's because Patty Gray shepherded me around and drove me back to my dorm in Tabler. I mean, she literally drove 